So, hi, uh, I'm Jeremy Holman, that's me there, and uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about, like it says, big O and asymptotic analysis, and uh, so the, I know the audience here is really varied, and kind of the, the target of the talk is, um, you know, maybe you're a successful working programmer, but you don't have a computing science degree, and you kind of never got around to taking that third year course that makes sense for computing science majors, but not for engineers or people who just fell into it. Um, or maybe that was a long time ago. Um, if you just finished your honors or your master's degree, then I apologize in advance for boring you. Um, uh, so yes, that. Um, one other thing is that um, I have sort of allocated, I think we've got about an hour and a half total, and I've kind of, I'm hoping that I've got about an hour worth of talk um, and so I encourage you to decide when you want to use the other half hour, whether you want to interrupt or save it. I don't care. Um, and if you interrupt a lot, then we won't get to the end of my slides, and they'll be fine with me, um, <laughs> because I like uh, fielding questions. So um, you have to make up your mind about that. Just one quick note is we do have a little bit of time afterwards. So if, before you leave, we want to make announcements and do something called random access. So. Right, so the goal is to be done in, we're out here at nine? Yeah. Okay, well in fact, hmm, hmm. Well then we don't, we don't have an hour plus half an hour. That's interesting. Okay, well, we'll whatever. So, why is this worth talking about um, before I actually get into the talk itself? And so, as it says there, I'm now employed at Shutterfly, but last time Bay Piggies met, I wasn't employed. I've been doing a lot of interviewing the last two months. Um, and. Uh, by the way, Shutterfly, I'm pretty sure, is hiring, but uh, I don't think there's any Python. Sorry about that. So um, um, a lot of uh, employers uh, in interviews ask me, and I don't know if it's just because I tell them I'm good at algorithms, but they ask me a lot of algorithms questions. Um, and so I don't know what everybody else's experience is like, but that seems to be a pretty popular interviewing strategy. And part of what it means to ask you about what a good algorithm is, is, people, is they'll also ask you, how fast does it run? And the answer they want to hear is a big O answer. Um, and uh, so this is like sort of important from a career perspective, and I think this is actually a farce. And so um, honestly, I think that interviewers shouldn't ask you these questions for 99% of uh, programming positions. And if you're an interviewer and you're asking questions like that, I encourage you to consider whether or not that's actually what you care about in your candidates. But uh, nonetheless, it's kind of a reality that at least when I'm looking for work, uh, the fact that I'm good at this seems to be uh, useful to me, and if you're not good at it, maybe it's not useful to you that you're not good at it. So that um, it's also kind of useful occasionally when you're writing code, but not super often, in fact. <laughs> um, I wish it was useful really often because I think it's really fun. So um, let me see. Um, does the tech? No, nope, that's not how that works. Boom. Uh, so what is big O for? And we're gonna, I'm going to talk about what is asymptotic analysis in a second. And what big O is for is comparing functions, but the functions that it's, it, sorry, functions in the mathematical sense, but in particular where it's actually useful for comparing them is comparing algorithms. So you've got some problem that needs solving, uh, requires a little computing science, not just a little bit of software engineering. You've got some, maybe some candidate algorithms, and you want to say which of these algorithms should we go with before you start figuring out how we're actually going to turn one of those algorithms into code. And uh, that's kind of when big O comes up. Um, and so algorithms, like what does it mean to compare algorithms? So algorithms compete on features, of course. So like one example is that if you've got two sorts, one of the sorts might be a stable sort, the other sort might not be a stable sort. Um, Python's built in, um, I can't hear myself anymore, but that's okay with me. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm easy. Is, is it too loud out here? Yeah. It's too loud for that speaker. Yeah. Um, Full sound check here. Yeah, okay. So blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. If you put it closer to the wall, we can hear him shout, and we can hear him. No, 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 I don't need to do that, and I don't want feedback, so. <laughs> 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 feedback sucks. Um, okay, so. Um, so Python's built-in sort, for example, uh, has the property that's stable, and that's an extra feature that, for example, the C library's built-in sort doesn't have, and sometimes you value that feature. But, um, so sometimes algorithms compete on features, but first and foremost, 
I mean, usually the algorithms you're comparing are expected to have the same set of features, otherwise you wouldn't be comparing them in the first place. So what do they then compete on? Um, and, uh, and what they compete on is the resources they consume. And so the number one resource that they're going to consume is time, right? So, uh, you know, CPU time, uh, wall, uh, wall time. Um, there are other resources that you care about, but that's like the one people talk about the most, and that's the one we're mostly going to talk about tonight, and then I'll kind of mention some of the other alternatives. Um, so uh, I have an example problem, and I have come up with two algorithms for it, and maybe you have some other algorithms that you can come up with, but, um, and by the way, if you need the wireless password, you have a limited time to get it before I wipe the whiteboard. Um, <laughs> um, well, there's a little idea. Um, so uh, you've got two documents, maybe they're just big text files. Um, in my sample code, we're just going to imagine they're already in ginormous strings because I didn't want to deal with any of the other code. Uh, just keep it simple. And you want to know how many words are there that are present in both of these documents. So you know, one of the documents is like, I don't know, foobar baz, the other document is like blah, 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 bar. And they both share the word bar, so the score is one. And so. I mean, this is really a trivial problem, of course, but um, that way we won't get lost in the code. Um, so you want to uh, figure out what are your algorithm alternatives and what algorithms are going to have better running time. Um, so one of the things we're really interested about here is not just which one's faster on small inputs, but when the problem gets big enough that you actually care about how fast it runs, which algorithm is getting slower faster. That is to say, which algorithm's kind of growth in the amount of time it uses grows more scarily, right? So, and, and again, this is because, um, you know, you care about these large inputs, and I'm going to come back to this, but you care about these large inputs because on small inputs, whatever, it's like a quarter of a microsecond, it's like seven microseconds, I mean, I don't care, don't spend the engineering time on figuring that out, right? But, you know, you want to crawl the entire World Wide Web and find correlations and like maybe you should do so in an efficient manner, right? So, um, you know, or maybe you want to like simulate a nuclear reactor and you have to simulate every atom in the nuclear reactor, some ridiculous thing like that, and it's a really big problem and so you should do it efficiently. And uh, so algorithm analysis, we mostly focus on large instances, uh, large inputs to the algorithm. Um, and so we want to think about um, you know, not how this, not these two documents with both like 20 words in them or 100 words in them, but like what if they both got a thousand or a million or a billion words in them, what is that going to look like? Um, so I just need to... Okay, so um, we're going to go back to abstract algorithms, but for a little while we're going to talk about concrete code instead. And so this is my first attempt to solve this problem. Um, and it's a crappy attempt, um, and that's the point. So let's just quickly walk through what the algorithm does. Uh, I assume that at the beginning I've got my documents in these strings left and right. Um, and I don't know if this code compiles, by the way, because I never bothered trying, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's just pseudocode that happens to look a lot like Python, um, which is why I like Python in the first place. Um, so uh, yeah, first of all, we're going to do this split to kind of tokenize the two strings. And uh, all my both of my algorithms do this split, and I'm going to ignore the cost of the split because it complicates the conversation, but doesn't actually change the answers. So I'm just going to pretend those two things are free, and you're going to let me slide on that one, um, unless you want to distract the whole talk. Um, so after we do this tokenization phase, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? We, we, uh, we initialize a counter, and then we, we try every word in the left document. We start with this flag here. We go through the entire right-hand document, and uh, and if we find a match, then we set this flag to true. And if the flag was true by the end of the document, then we found a new word that matched up. And, uh, and we increment this count here, and then we turn the count. And I just noticed a bug in my uh, code. Awesome. <laughs> OK, well, anyway, I'll leave it as an exercise to the interested reader to figure out what the bug is in my code relative to what I thought this was going to do. Um, so it overcounts a little bit. Um, so uh, yes, uh, problem number one. So. Uh, let me see. How, how much time does this take? And so, how much time it takes depends on how long each line takes to run and how many times each line runs. Does that make sense? Kind of dumb, right? Like, how easy is that? 
So I'm going to define a couple of variables for the purpose of uh, having this conversation, which are just the length of those two uh, after tokenization splits. Uh, and so I want to talk about this bit in here. Um, and there's an annotation error too. There, so I really should have. 10 is redundant. You just removed the 10. Well, in fact, 10 and 11 should have been <laughs> dedented, you see. <laughs> so um, anyway. No, just, just remove 10 and move 11 up. That's all we have. No, no, because if... Uh, it's pseudocode. Yeah, we'll call it pseudocode. Yeah, yeah, the indentation problem, it's pseudocode. So, but, but no, I don't think that's correct. Because if... Uh, I mean, did I make a serious, serious mistake here? Because if flag is false, then you don't want to... You know, if flag hasn't come... If this hasn't happened, you don't want to increase the counter here. Um, so I don't think we can remove this, but, but these are both supposed to be dedented a level, and that's now two bugs in my code, and I really should have run it. OK, so anyway. So let's just talk about this little bit here. So this line takes time h, whatever time h is. It, you know, imagine we put a timer on this, and we know how long it takes, right? You can make, maybe think about that as Python opcodes in the interpreter, or you can think about it as wall time, or I don't care. Um, and again, this takes some amount of time. And on every run through this loop, we definitely run G, and maybe we run H, and I'm going to pretend we always run H, and so we're going to overcount a little bit, but I don't know how much, right? And, and then we have to do this assignment here. You know, part of what this for loop does is it finds the next one and assigns it into the variable, and that takes time F. And so this section here, these three lines, uh, they take, uh, each time they go around, they take this much time, F plus G plus H. And how many times do they go around? Well, it's pretty obvious that it goes around equal to the number of words there are in the right-hand document, right? That's sort of obvious. Nodding faces, okay, good. So let's move on to the next sort of uh, larger loop. How much time does, and again, this was dedented and I'm a dumbass, okay. So how much time does all of this take from here to here? All this uh, for loop that starts at line five. And so again, it goes around a number of times equal to y. And so it does this thing, y times, right? That's just this here. And then it also does this bit and this bit and this bit here, whoops, uh, y times. Is this still making sense? Okay, I see lots of people nodding and that's good. Is anybody shaking their head but doing it very, very subtly? Okay, good. Uh, there's no point in getting lost at this point. You can get lost later. So, um, so then we've got a little bit of bookkeeping to do at the beginning and at the end, blah, blah, blah. And again, I'm leaving out A and B entirely because blah, blah, blah. And so the, the total amount of time that this implementation takes is some function of the length of left words and the length of right words. It's this it is time based on this uh, you know, function in the mathematical sense, right? This time, based on these two variables, is this function, OK? This is a big, ugly pain in the butt. It's like really ugly to look at and talk about. And it's not even accurately very precise. Because remember when I said, I'm just going to pretend it always does h. But of course, it doesn't always do h. So it's not even particularly precise. And the same problem up here with, I mean, it, oh, dang, right? So, so we've got this kind of like you know, worst of both worlds. It's really ugly to look at. And it's not even quite perfect. Um, let me see. Oh, yes. So, suppose that we take this out of Python and we port it to Ruby or we port it to C. So, what changes? So. So we keep the same algorithm, the same plan for how we solve the problem, but we move it to a different programming language. So what changes is all of these constants here probably have different values now, right? Maybe the Ruby interpreter is a little slower. Maybe the JavaScript interpreter is a little faster. Maybe the C compiler, after compiling to, to you, know, um, you know, machine code, uh, compiling and assembling, maybe it's a hell of a lot faster. I don't know. Um, so. All of, those, all of those kind of early alphabet letters become unknowns, but 
the overall structure of my analysis doesn't change, right? So, you know, I don't know what the new language is, but whatever it is, it's got a different function, but the function still has this kind of shape, right? Okay. New code. So, um, as it turns out, that last algorithm really sucked, and this algorithm's somewhat better. Maybe there's a better one than this, but I didn't bother thinking of a better one. So, um, let's look at what this does. So again, right up at the top, we do this, uh, this tokenizing phase, and I'm gonna keep on ignoring it. We create a set, we initialize our counter, and then we go through the left one, and every word we find, we make sure it's in the set. And of course, we get duplicate words, set.add doesn't you know, do anything. It's not like a list, right? And then once we've done that, we go through the uh, right-hand list, and if the word was in the set, we count it, and then we remove it from the set so we don't double count it, which is what the bug was in my previous code, aside from the indentation problems. And, and then once we're at the end, we've counted all the words that appeared in both documents, and we return that count. We're following? Am I going too slow? Very polite of you, very polite. Okay, so, um, so I'm not gonna go through the analysis at quite the same speed, but I want to point out first of all that we still have two for loops, but previously one of the for loops was nested in the other one, and now they're not nested. And this is a big deal. And so, uh, you know, we've kind of got this bit that goes around y times, and that's ef, and this bit that goes around z times. There's another friggin' annotation level. Toy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We return quickly, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and miraculously get the right answer because we carefully arrange for the documents to only have the first word matching. <laughs> okay, anyway. So there's a bunch that goes around Y times, a bunch that goes around Z times, and a couple other things that only happen once up front, and that's not what I was supposed to say anyway. But the concept is not too bad. So, uh, Right, so we've got it, again, we've got the same kind of uh, properties as T1 and T2 had, which is this is ugly and imprecise and kind of the worst of both worlds. So those are just the uh, previous ugly formula I copied onto one slide, kind of ghastly. Um, but beyond the ghastliness, what I'd like you to notice is that they have kind of fundamental shapes to them and the fundamental shapes are a little different. And so again, you remember that I said that if we port it, you know, all these, all these uh, early alphabet letters change to some other value, but the Y's and the Z's stay the same, right? And so here we go, just the Y's and the Z's are kind of in different shapes. This is important. Okay, where am I at my notes here? I'm way past this. So basically here, I've attempted to justify uh, that I'm gonna do a lot of throwing away of constant multiples and make it clear that that makes sense when I wanna compare algorithms rather than chunks of actual code. Um, hopefully that persuaded you vaguely and I'm gonna review that again in a little while. So, wrong window. So I want to justify something else now and that's the asymptotic aspect of this, which I haven't explained yet. So, um, so I have a question for you, and that is, which of these two functions has bigger values? And so, the first function with the 100s in it, I mean, it's got a couple of 100s in it, and those are big and scary, right? And so that must have bigger, bigger values. Hopefully, this is a really easy question for everyone, but I'm gonna go through it like it's not. Um, so, it's got a couple of 100s in it, those must be big and scary, and sure enough, if you, know, you set n equal to one, then yeah, I mean, you know, the first one comes out larger, in fact, I think. So even at 50, n is still larger, but at 101, the second one takes, you know, goes past, and you keep cranking n up into large numbers, because again, remember I said that we normally when we're doing algorithm analysis, think about large numbers because, you know, searching the entire web or something like that. And what you notice is that when we get n up to a million, the second one is basically almost exactly twice the first one. And so what happened here is this term mattered and these terms didn't matter. 
I mean, they mattered down here in the, at the, you know, the shallow end of the pool. But up here where it mattered which algorithm you used, only one term mattered. And so this is the next kind of uh, idea we're going to use in algorithm analysis. We're going to take, uh, we're going to throw away all the terms that are dominated by other terms. That's the mathy word for that, dominated. And what does dominated mean? Well, technically what dominated means is that this happens. So that's not very helpful. But um, dominated means various things depending on exactly what kind of a function you have. You know, uh, functions are kind of, um, they've got terms that are added together. Um, that's what term means, is it means you're adding them together. Um, if what you have is a polynomial, which is to say every term has this form, you know, you've got some variable, and there's an exponent, and every term has that kind of form. There's a, you know, a, a constant and the variable and an exponent. In this case, the exponent is zero. Um, if that's the form of your equation, then the dominant term is just the one with the biggest exponent, and that's that, and you're done, right? Um, if you've got other weird things like signs, which doesn't happen in computing, or, um, but I mean, is mathematically still relevant, but practically completely irrelevant, or um, you know, ex exponential functions or uh, factorial functions or all sorts of other things, then you can't use that simple rule, but it's, there still is kind of this definition of dominated, and we're gonna throw away all the terms that are dominated and only keep the terms that are not dominated, the dominant terms. So um, that's the other kind of, uh, you know, a couple, it was just a few slides back, I was saying that we're gonna throw away all the constants, which in this case would mean, you know, we throw all those away. And we're gonna throw away all the dominated terms. So, um, even though it doesn't look like it here from the perspective of asymptotic analysis, these are actually the same function. Um, oh, right. I mean, that kind of says it all. That's what we want to do. When, we're, when, we, uh, when we have two algorithms that, whose performance we want to compare, we're going to generate these functions that describe exactly how fast they run, and then we're going to throw away all the constants, throw away all the dominated terms, and only report what's left. And the other thing we should do is we should probably tell the person who is listening to us that we did all that, that this isn't supposed to be precise, that this is supposed to be the, you know, the bird's eye view or the 10,000 foot view or whatever you know, uh, overused business jargon you like. Um, where is my, right. So um, there's a formal notation for doing this, and I will shock you all to hear that the name of that formal notation is big O. Um, I know, you're surprised, right? And so uh, in my next slide, we're gonna look at the formal definition of big O, and it's gonna be mathy, and many people are gonna be like, yes, and many people are gonna be like, well, you've lost me. And so I wanna just say two things before I show you the next bit about the math here. Uh, the first bit is that although there's a complicated aspect to it, it's actually like stupid simple once you get past the little complicated first bump. And the second thing is no one will care. So you can just ignore it anyway. And the reason is because nobody actually ever uses the formal definition except when you're trying to figure out like which way is up in asymptotic analysis. So, like, you know, you're, you're studying it and you're trying to be like, what the hell are we talking about here? And when you're actually using it for anything, you only use these heuristic rules and it just turns out to always be correct. So, yeah. Um, even among people, you know, like even among experts, it's, it, it's typically not the case that people can tell you what the formal definition is because they don't care. So don't freak out. Wrong window again. So, we are allowed to say that some function f is a member of big O of g. So f and g are functions. Um, and f might be like this, or it might not be. Or it might be like either of these. Those, one of those might be my f. So we're allowed to say that f is a member of big O of g, or for short people to say f is big O of g, if and only if we can find some positive constants, m and t, that makes this, net, this last line true. So, yeah, I'll just let you read that for a second. And the whole reason we're doing this is because we want to tell people the G one, 
and not tell them F because they won't friggin' understand what you're saying anyway. I mean, you know, okay, you're not looking at the screen right now. What, what, what do you think if I tell you, oh yeah, the running time of this function is Y times E plus F plus Z times G plus H plus I plus J plus A plus C for some values of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. You're like, shut up. What was that? That was useless. I didn't understand anything you said. And again, since it wasn't even very precise in the first place, and it gets worse with actual algorithms you care about, the lack of precision, it's kind of ridiculous that I did all that blethering that you didn't understand and uh, didn't even get a precise answer. And so that's kind of why this all exists, is because we want to put them in these simple, oh, I see a hand. We want to put them in these simple, comprehensible families. Um, and so that's what we picked G for. Yeah? Wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it reject it? Sorry, I don't understand. Well, so this is, so this is not... A single character for a function, wouldn't it reject it? So this is not, um, so I'm trying to avoid using the word function during this talk, I should have said this earlier, sorry. Trying to avoid using the word function to mean Python function or C function. So I, I really should have said that earlier and I apologize. So. The reason is because this is all about functions in the mathematical sense, things that take in mathematical integers and output mathematical integers. And so that's what f is in this case, is it's the mathematical function that expresses the running time of some chunk of code. I'm using chunk of code a lot. I hope. still be wrong. So I don't understand syntax. what. So, the, so, the, so programming syntax doesn't apply here. This is. talking for about a programming language. But, but this is not in the domain of the programming language. This is in the domain of, of, of math looking at the programming language, right? So, so if, I, if I take some, like an actual piece of code and I like time it on the wall and I say, oh, it took like 48 seconds. 48 seconds isn't a notion inside the world of the programming language. It's, it's a measurement of the code. And so in the same sense. Then what is f going to mean? Does f have two meanings? Uh, standard notation is the point, so we're trying to review here. So that's cool. Um, um, so, so f is only this this measurement of how fast your code is, and it's a measurement that um, you know you kind of do on paper, even not even with a clock, right? And it's a uh, um, so you're in, in the case of my earlier. It's like this here is f, this, this t thing, right? And it takes in some, some properties of your code. Um, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It takes in some properties of the input that you run your code on. And it outputs, just as math, it outputs some kind of an estimate of how long the program will run for. And so, um, you know, you're going to, um, well, I mean, sorting is the canonical go-to example you're gonna sort some list of, you know, somebody was dumb and shuffled the phone book, right? And you wanna put the phone book back in order. And so the question is, how long is it gonna take? And how long it's gonna take depends on whether the phone book has got like a thousand people in it or a trillion people in it. But it also depends on whether you do it in a clever way or a dumb way. And so you've got different functions that kind of predict how long it'll take you to resort your phone book. And, and those functions uh, need to know how big the phone book that you're resorting is. I don't know if I'm answering that, but it looks like you've lost interest in my answer. So I think I'm going to move on. Um, so the tricky part of this is this idea of there exist positive constants, right? Um, so like if you can find any M and T that make this true, then this is true, and you get to use that big O. And so that's the tricky part, is like trying to imagine how to search kind of the entire space of you know, positive real numbers and verify whether any of them if, you know, satisfy this, right? So uh, I've, got no, uh, I've got no good solution for how you do that. Um, once you've done that, though, it's really simple, right? You, you know, if you've got the right M and the T, you just kind of you just kind of look at how the function works. You multiply your simple function by m. That's obvious, easy, right? And then 
you just start n at t, and it, you just try all n's up to infinity, greater than t, and you see if it's true. So this is where I'm going to go to the whiteboard. Last chance. In fact, you need an eraser? No, I've got an eraser. Okay. Mm, this is racing, but a little less. Maybe I guess I should pull this in front of the camera. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> 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 Maybe not such a good idea. I think, yeah, exactly. Go ahead and erase that, exactly. So I think I have some slides here that have some white space at the bottom. How's that for? Here we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, we've we've got this M. Is this large enough font? Probably not. So we've got this M and this T. And we need to say for all n greater than T. And I'm only using part of the board because I want part of it or something else. Okay, that's, is that legible? That is not showing up at all. <laughs> is there any way you can type it on the computer? Um, I really am terrified of my operating system here. <laughs> Someone has me using Mac at work and I hate it and I'm terrified every move I make. I think I'm unwilling to try to use this operating system in front of other people. <laughs> Especially for some of the syntax that doesn't show up easily. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, well, um, for the benefit of people watching this video later, all I've written so far is the stuff that was on the slide before I directed the whiteboard. Um, how about the people at the back of the room? Is this vaguely legible? Okay, so what is this, what is this all about? So we've got some function, and I'm just going to draw some functions now. So far, so calm, right? So I've got some function like this. And this is my f. And I've got some other function. Nice straight line g. Easy to understand, right? And so you don't want to have to report this wibbly wobbly complicated f to anybody. You're hoping that g will be good enough to report instead. And so you're allowed to use big O if you can do if you can combine this m and this t into this in the right way and get the right result. So what's the right way and the right result? So m lets you scale, it's a multiplier, m is for multiplier. And so you get to scale your g as big as you want. Right? You can pick any m you like, pick a million, I don't care. So what does that do? m times g goes up at this crazy new slope, right? So that's, that's a good start. And then t, threshold. t is for threshold. So t is some number below which it's not your problem if you screwed up. Okay? So it's like, yeah, I'm just going to put t here, whatever. So now, if you picked your m and your t correctly, and it really is the case that f is big O of g, then it must be the case that everywhere up from t, g is larger, m times g is larger than f, it's over f, right? So you're allowed to stretch it up and you're allowed to create a safe zone of I don't care, but outside of your safe zone, g has to be a ceiling that f stays under forever, out to infinity, okay? Are we feeling like this made some kind of sense? I'm seeing some nodding, that makes me feel good. Is anybody like, what the hell did you say? Hit me. Just a quick question. Are you going to do, not a full squeeze theorem, but are you just going to show some intuitions for here's an n squared, here's an n, and just so we can later kind of see how they compare? Mostly no. Okay. I could probably paraphrase this if you get any more, if you get some confused thoughts out of the good paraphrase. <laughs> um, I don't see any confused looks yet. Okay. So um, 
What's not clear is whether or not I've actually succeeded, right? Because we don't have all of f here. And so it's, it, it really depends on what kind of function f is. So if f is like, let's call this f1, uh, no race cars involved. So if f1 is like n cubed plus, I don't care. Remember, I'm just going to throw out all those dominated terms anyway. Then what f looks like when it's actually drawn out um, is some crazy thing like that. And it gets friggin' steep, friggin' fast, right? I mean, it starts going up pretty serious. And so if you've got, if your g is some straight line, well, it doesn't actually turn out to matter how much you scale it, like how much you tilt that straight line. You go far enough out into, like up the positive x-axis, and eventually this increasing f here is gonna punch through your super, you know, you've got like some crazy super highly scaled g, right? And you're like, yeah, it'll never catch up. No, it's totally gonna catch up. Come on, right? The slope of this is constant, and the slope of this thing increases as you go along. Like it just gets steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper. So you can't use a straight line. This M here seemed pretty powerful a second ago, right? You're just like, yeah, I'll put a billion in there, put a trillion, I don't care, or something really big, it doesn't matter. But if you've picked the wrong G for your F, it doesn't matter what M you pick. So that's kind of why you know, some things aren't big O of something else, right? So you have to pick a function where this scaling trick will suffice and this, like, and this dead zone down at zero, right? So maybe the dead zone down at zero is like maybe, maybe your f starts up here like it always does some initialization work or something like that, right? And then it goes like this. And you pick a g, your g always starts, I mean, you can, you can start your g anywhere, but you want your g to be nice and simple, so therefore it will start at zero. And so your G starts here, and you're like, oh, you know, damn, right? No matter how steep I make it, it doesn't catch up until here. Well, that's fine. You're allowed to not catch up until somewhere. That's okay, as long as you go on forever after that, right? So you just put your T out here, and you're like, yeah, no problem. This is my I don't care zone. So that's why T is in here. It's because it allows you to start your G function like through the, through the origin, which means that your Gs tend to not have any like annoying little low order terms in them. They just are like one clean, simple term that you know, makes it really easy to say like, oh yeah, it's n squared. Oh yeah, it's like two to the n. No problem, right? Because uh, that, that's what you kind of want. Yo. So I was with you right before the slide where you said I have to do a runtime, like I have to complete the runtime for my function. But where does m and t come into picture when I'm trying to complete the runtime of my function, like my code? Right, okay. So I have two answers. So. I'm going to actually answer your question, but first I'm going to say, all that runtime computing, we're actually going to not bother doing that ever again. Yes. So the whole point of this is being lazy. So we'll come back to that. But pretending for a sec I didn't say that, that that wasn't true, I'll answer your question anyway. You compute, you hypothetically <laughs> compute the runtime complexity of your code and that gives you an F. And you've got your F and it's your ugly function, right? And then you go to your boss is like, so like how fast is it gonna be anyway? I mean, just, just big O, I don't need like, you know, I don't need an actual wall clock. And you're like, uh, and you don't wanna be like spewing out this ridiculously complicated, like it, nonsense, so you wanna give them a little short. So, so you pick some G that lets you, you know, lets you have this property, and it only has this property if you can find some M and some T that satisfies this equation. Right? And so, so if your f, again, like if your f is this kind of, like it's got an n cubed in it and some multiplier of the n cubed, then it's got an n squared in it, some constant on that, it's got an n and some constant on the bottom and blah, blah, blah. And you pick g to be like, oh, how about just n? Then it doesn't matter what m and t you pick because you can't pick an m big enough that a line is gonna keep up with this, this uh, cubic function, right? Or you could pick, you could say n squared, how about n squared? But again, it doesn't matter what constant, what m you pick, n squared can't keep up with this sucker, right? So you better pick something big that can keep up with this, like n cubed can keep up with it once you scale it, right? 
uh, and I'm going to come back to this later, end of the fourth will also keep up with NQ because end of the fourth will just like take off and be gone forever, right? So, so you, you don't actually pick M and T. It's just that when you're saying like this G that I'm hoping I can use to represent my F, you know, to stand in for my F, there must exist some M and some T that cause this to be true. This, for all n greater than t, f of n is less than m times g of m, g of n, right? And so you don't actually, you don't actually pick these variables. They just must exist in perfect map land. How am I doing? Does that feel like? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so when I'm drawing examples on the board, it's really easy to draw lines, right? I like drawing lines. My lines aren't very straight, but they're better than my cubic functions or my quadratic functions. But your, your algorithms in practice are almost never linear. Oh, I wish they were. So, um, you know, just to kind of, you know, you, you've, got this, you've got this function, whatever it is, and it's f, and it does some wibbly wobbly thing, and then it like takes off like a jackrabbit, right? So, you know, maybe it takes off like n cubed, or maybe it takes off like something else. And so again, you're allowed to use any G that takes off faster in the end, right? That when you go away out to those big problems, those big simulate the nuclear reactor problems, those big, like crawl every web page on the internet and find out blah, blah, blah about them. You know, um, like, like you know, Google does this thing where they like come up with automatic translations by just like looking at translations of web pages on the internet and trying to figure out which words are used in the same place on two different pages. And just like, yeah, that turns out to be good enough to actually make decent, trans I mean, tolerably decent machine translations if you run it on a Hogelian Mophilian web pages. <laughs> if you only run a thousand web pages, it's useless. So anyway, you have to do all this comparing back and forth between all these things. And if you do too much comparing, it's gonna never finish. But if you can figure out how to do just enough comparing, maybe if you throw like a billion dollars worth of computers at it, you can get it done. <laughs> And so, like that's that's this business about like, you know, if it you you want a better algorithm that kind of takes off at a less aggressive clip, right? Because because then hopefully you can you know hopefully you can buy enough computers to solve your problem. And when you're summarizing your algorithm to compare the two algorithms, one of them takes off at this like really crazy aggressive clip, and the other one's just kind of scary. You know, your boss is going to go white when he, like, here's how many computers you need, but he's then going to pony up, right? And so you want these, like, summaries of the two algorithms that are simple enough that you can convey them and that convey the difference between the one that just, like, goes and the one that just gets kind of a little bit scary. My brain's melted down on the Fs and the Gs and everything else, but if I, you tell me that I have a summary, do you have examples of summaries that we commonly see? Yes, and we will come to those. So I'm gonna I'm gonna postpone that answer. So I'm gonna put the whiteboard aside now. Are we any other questions about the whiteboard? Do you have examples of Python code? So I've got those earlier examples and I'm gonna revisit them, yeah. This is not the slide we're on. There's my examples you commonly see. Very next slide. Since you asked, I meant to put more on these examples in my talk and didn't. So I will address it right now. <laughs> Just like, yes, that was in my that was in my plan. So in fact, this is the relevant page here. So back to the whiteboard for just a second. So I'll drag it all the way so the camera can see it and write it in really big letters. So the one of these which is right here, you can even see it already on the whiteboard. How is that? Um, so this is my F up here, and it's a big friggin' mess. And I don't want to tell anybody that ever. And my big O of this is pretty simple. It's just that. I'm allowed to throw away this stuff, this little plus at the end. I'm allowed to throw that away. But I can't reduce this any farther. So if I, if I were to give you, so this is my G. If I were to give you 
say I was to leave one of these out, right? Say I was to say, oh yeah, it's big O of, and so remember that Y here is length of left. You probably can't read that, but you heard me say it. Maybe I'll try to write the one next, next, next one kind of more. Maybe that's a little more legible. So if I left one of those out of this big O, then I'd have, there'd be some case that you could come back at me with. You know, say I just said, oh, it, it only depends on Y. Then you'd come back at me with some case where the left-hand document was really small, and the right-hand document was really big, and the bigger you made the right-hand document, the slower my algorithm got, even though you kept the left one the same. And I told you it was just dependent on the left one, and I'd be lying. And that assumes both left and right are completely independent. Doesn't assume anything. You just, here, they're just two inputs. This, this here, though, I mean, the reason you can't reduce it. In other words, if they were, if there was ah, dependency, yes, that's right. So reduce. that's right. If they had some kind of relationship, you might be able to reduce it. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely right. If they had some kind of relationship, you might be able to reduce it, and you might or might not want to. Um, and I'll, on the very next prepared slide, I actually have a sort of example of that. Well, maybe it's quite a bit later, actually. Um, uh, about Dijkstra's algorithm. And so uh, when I come to Dijkstra's algorithm, I should, uh, um, which is a like famous graph algorithm. Um, Dijkstra like designed Pascal, kind of a big deal. And the first thing that he did that he put his name on was this graph theory algorithm, which is really simple, but it was a big deal in like 1960 something or whatever it was he published this. So um, used to be you could like really get your name out there for doing really simple things. <laughs> Like, uh, Tony Hoare was knighted you know, for developing one sorting routine. <laughs> now it's the sorting routine, <laughs> but, uh, ouch. <laughs> anyway. So, um, so up on the board here, we've got the other example there, and I'm just going to copy it out because only I can see it probably, which is my G. Well, this isn't actually my G, my sort of almost G, my kind of precursor to G, I'll call it G prime. So it was Y times Z plus times some constants, right? Plus Y times some constants, plus one times some constants. I'm just rounding all the constants down to one because we don't care, nobody's gonna grief us over it. And so in this case, I mean, we could say big O of all this garbage. But we might as well make it as simple as we can. I can see some people can't actually see this. Maybe if I go off of the... So we could put this whole thing in, call this whole thing G, it'd be, it'd be technically correct, but it would be dumb. And the reason it'd be dumb is because it's more complicated than it needs to be. We are still totally within our right to say here, that first function was big O of Y times Z. So we went from that, that big ugly mess that's still kind of up here on the on this projection screen and we just got rid of all of it except for one little bit that was the bit that actually mattered when you get into big inputs. This is the thing that explains why that first algorithm was dumb, and the second algorithm, which just has this, <laughs> it's over here now, just has this y plus z is better. Maybe it's not optimal, I think it probably is optimal, but it's certainly better. So. If y and z are really big numbers, and they're how much money you're going to spend solving this problem, would you rather multiply them or add them? It's kind of a no-brainer, right? A million times a million? I don't think so. Um, a million plus a million, well, maybe if you wanted the answer badly enough. So, um, so that's kind of it right there. So that, um, that's going to be kind of my like, reference to um, the working examples. And when we get more complicated algorithms, they actually do interesting things. So sorting is the kind of canonical 
Um, you know, if you take, you take a third year algorithms course, they're gonna teach you like four or five or six different sorting algorithms. Why do they do that? Is it because they want you to know how to sort in six ways? No, you don't need to sort even one way. It's in the library, go away. The reason is because sorting is complicated enough to like actually require you to wake up and pay attention and to like really engage in the material and have competing alternatives, but it's simple enough that you can actually get through it in, you know, like six of them in a week and a half or whatever. So um, I'm gonna go back in a, in a, you know, some more slides and revisit some of the obvious contenders, quick sort and merge sort and uh, heap sort, so kind of the big dogs. Um, there's some other specialized ones that are also worth learning, but um, if any of them are worth learning, which they're not. But, um, so, oh, sorry, I lost my place there. Got a little far afield. So um, all of those kind of have, like kind of all these complicated nested structures that you know kind of interact with each other, and some of them run, some of the parts run some of the time, and they don't run other parts of the time, and exactly how fast they run depends on exactly what architecture, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, it all boils down to the same kind of thing about how big the list you're sorting is will be the main thing that determines how long it takes to sort it. And there's just gonna be this simple function that goes from how big your list is to how long you take. And there's some kind of multiplier on there, and if you, you know, you're running it on a fast computer, it'll go faster, a slow computer, it'll go slower. But that multiplier is gonna be the same whether it's a really big problem or a really small problem. So um, that's implementation versus algorithm right there. And so they all have the same, uh, the same time. We're going to see that in a second. And so um, that's almost the end of the introduction, or not introduction, but the, the like, um, let's walk through the essentials part of my talk. Um, and the one, come on, focus, please. The one remaining bit here is, in practice, you tend to kind of figure out it's one of these candidates. The algorithm you're doing is one of these candidates. These are the kind of families you see a lot. And so, you know, we say, oh, log n, we call that logarithmic growth. Got a little, some little examples on the right side. Um, so if you've got an already sorted list and you can jump back and forth in it to just find exactly where you need to go, that takes big old log n. Um, if you need to, if your list isn't sorted, you need to look at everything once. That's obviously gonna take n time to do n lookups, right? <laughs> So that's linear time. Lots of things in practice are linear time. Um, anything that has to look at everything can't be any faster than linear because just the act of looking at everything meant it was linear. Um, we would say that this um, y plus z, we call that linear because you know, the total size is kind of just that y plus z also, so it's like basically the same as the final running time. Um, this n log n is a really popular, uh, popular uh, candidate. Uh, People would just say n log n, or they call it log linear, or I was looking this up on Wikipedia, Wikipedia says people call it linear rhythmic. Never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I also learned about the Martian space war of 1942. Um, so, um, lots of things are n log n again, but the most famous examples are good sorting algorithms are n log n. Um, quadratic time, uh, it's actually hard to think of good, simple examples that are, uh, you know, where the best algorithm is quadratic time. Um, but you know, if you if you do uh, multiplication the way you learn to do it in elementary school, where you just kind of line them up and you kind of do this thing where everyone goes against every other one, that works out to be quadratic time. All of these things above here, uh, we call polynomial, and. Uh, that just means that there's some C that we can pick, that it's n to the C, and uh, people who never write real code and who only talk about algorithms like to pretend that there's a magic line between polynomial and everything else that makes an infinite world of difference, and in my opinion, those people are crazy. Um, because I think it's a lot more um, nuanced than that, but it's a big deal when people talk about P versus NP, this is sort of kind of super oversimplified kind of what that is about. Um, anyway, lots, of, lots and lots of problems have solutions that are somewhere in polynomial, whether it's one of the ones I already mentioned or somewhere else. And then there's stuff that's slower than that. So uh, exponential is scary and slow, factorial is scary and slow. Lots of, of the time when you have some kind of space of things to search and you do some kind of a dumb search the space, 
you end up so you know, sort of naive, like, I don't know, I'll just try everything. That often ends up being exponential or factorial. And if, you're, if your um, inputs to the problem are small enough, you don't care, right? It's like, yeah, I've got like seven things to check. I'll just check all combinations, like two to the seven. That's like 128, whatever. Um, and you know, if your n is a million, then like, well, I mean, heck, if your n is like a thousand, this is like completely unacceptable. You just can't do this, right? So, um, whereas if, if your n is a thousand and you're up here somewhere, well, I don't care, n is a thousand, that's a tiny little number. What are you talking about, right? So that's why, that's why this kind of matters. So, um, as with every speaker, I am uh, pretty far through my time and not very far through my, well, I'm 60% of the, something of the way through my material. Um, and so I'm going to attempt to pick it up a little and see which of these things seem most important. Um, and I encourage people to cut in when they're interested. This is big O of one. Okay. When you multiply that big O of one out by the loop, you get linear, and that's why there's just so many algorithms where your first approach, you can kind of cut it down by a factor of n, by just like, oh, we can solve this with hash tables. Um, yeah. Um, and, and I see a lot of people take pictures of this. Um, I'm hoping that now that you've heard this part of the talk, if you go read the Wikipedia article on Big O, you'll be able to follow it. It's pretty intimidating. Um, it's got many, many lines in a row of math that all mean the same thing, but are in, like, differently arranged. And it's like, which one do I read first? And I don't understand any of them. Screw you. Um, but um, this business about this, this here, is the important thing. And all of the math on that page is trying to restate this, or state a special case of this, or lead you into this, or some other thing like that. So, um, you know, like if you feel like you sort of, kind of, mostly got this, then you should feel happy on Wikipedia to go after this, I hope. And it will include things like this list. So, um, so I'm gonna try to move quickly through these at like four times the speed I originally planned to. So the first thing that, so, so the rest of this talk is about like things that people who like successfully got their B, but then forgot, you know, their B in the class, but then forgot what it meant and then tried to use it again three years later, kind of mistakes that I think people make a lot. Um, and some of these are just pedantic, maybe all of them are just like pedantic corrections and you can decide whether you care for yourself. So the first thing is that technically speaking, big O is not equivalence classes. So people say, you know, quicksort is and log n. In the, average, in the average case. And the word is, people think is means equals. And they often write it with an equal sign. And this is kind of cheating. There's another example, double sort, another sort you learn just because it sucks. Um, although, if you like sorts that suck, there's ones that are lots worth the bubble sort. <laughs> um, so, so this is how people normally write this, and you know, you go ahead, you want to communicate with people, you communicate in the language they're using, but if you want to like, have it clear in your head, this is mistaken. This is much better. The time of bubble sort is a member of this family. And, um, and the next thing to know is that these families are nested. And so everything that is big O of n squared, it's technically true that it's also big O of n cubed. Now, don't ever use that fact because somebody will just think you got the wrong answer, right? But anyway, so that's maybe kind of pedantry, but, um, and I, I, I partly led you into this particular form of confusion by saying the way we'll get the G is by just like throwing away all the constants and throwing away the dominated terms and keep the one thing that's left and that'll be the G. Well, I should have said that'll be unacceptable, like one acceptable G and the one we would like best, but not the only candidate, right? So that's, that's one thought. Um, so if, um, if big O is like a, a ceiling, like a bound above, do we have language for other kinds of relations? The answer is yes, we do. Uh, no one will ever use these outside of papers that only exist to talk about the difference between these things. Um, but we do have these alternatives. Um, so big O is like, says F is, is sort of like saying F is less than or equal to G. So G is like a ceiling, it's a budget. You know, you're never gonna, you, you say, I got to pick my budget, but now that I've picked it, I'm never gonna go above it ever again, right? So we also have big omega. 
Oh, and, and by the way, if you want to be really snooty and have nobody understand you ever, you can call it Big Omicron. No one who didn't just read up on it will understand you, including me. Um, so, <clears throat> Big Omega is bounded a floor. You're like, yeah, this is going to be at least as bad as this forever. It's never going to get this good ever again. Or rather, it's never going to get better than this ever again. Big Theta is bounded above and below. And the formal definition for Big Theta just says both of these must apply. And the way they both apply is that you use one value of m to stretch your g up and make a ceiling. And then you pick another value of m to stretch your g down and make a floor. Because you don't have to pick the same, right? you don't have to pick the same value of m and t. I mean, you might as well pick the same value of t. It doesn't matter. But m, you're going to have to stretch it up and down. Uh, almost always. So that's how, big, that's how big theta works. And so people usually mean big theta when they're talking about big O, because they usually are trying to say it's exactly like this. But they tend to use the, so this one you might hear someone say. You might say, you know, somebody who's like, spends too much time thinking about this, like me. And they might say, um, you know, um, oh, merge sorry, is big theta of n log n. You're like, wait a second, big theta? What? That's just a dice <laughs> it's going to get worse <laughs> right now. We also have strictly bounded above and strictly bounded below, and those are completely friggin' useless as far as I can tell. Little o and little omega. Okay. Um, so there's another thing here. I, t I said it's a budget, a ceiling, a kind of a, like it's never getting worse than this. People think, yo. Exactly. That's exactly correct. It's not that useless. It's very useless. It means that even constants do not... Um, so yes, it is. that is what it means. I agree. Um, uh, I don't know what it's useful for. You just said that uh, another function is, not, is never above that particular function. No matter what the constant is. Yeah, that's right. Um, but it, I, I mean, that is what it says. That's absolutely right. Um, and I am totally open to being wrong about it being useless. That's um, like totally a value judgment from my relatively limited uh, experience. Um, um, I mean, in practice, In, the, the only actual applicability of all this, again, is kind of, you know, you, you want to figure out which function to throw away, like, which, sorry, which, which algorithm to throw away, right? Which algorithm is not good enough and which other algorithm is good enough? Or ultimately, you want to say, yeah, we don't have any algorithm that's better than blah, and so uh, we can't solve this problem unless you give us a trillion dollars of hardware or something like that. I mean, we can't solve this problem on examples of the size that you care about. Um, you know, like you thought we were going to solve it on $100 of hardware, but you're just like completely, completely, completely mistaken. Um, and I, I feel like when that's, the, when that's what you're trying to get done, what you, what you really want is this, and people are just going to say they want this, and we're all just going to smile and nod and pretend that's right. And so that's why I say I think that having additional categories here I think it doesn't actually get any like hay made, if you see what I'm saying. I, but anyway, that's my thought about it. Um, I'm more than happy to be wrong about that. About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, is that sufficient? Um, so I said it's like this, this ceiling that you're never going to cross, this budget that you're never going to cross. And People often think that means that it's the worst case of the, what the algorithm can be. And so worst case versus average case, and also best case, but people rarely care about best case, is a separate dimension of concern. So you can, you can talk about big O of the worst case, or you can talk about big O of the average case. Those are both things you can talk about. And I, um, I don't really feel like I can um, persuade anybody who doesn't already believe this of this in the time that's available, but I just kind of want to mention that like worst case versus average case is a separate thing from big O, and, and big O applies to both of those, and big O applies to any kind of function you like, in fact. So it also applies to best case if you want it to. You're like, 
yeah, you, know, you, just, you just can't solve this problem any faster than log n, no matter what the inputs are, for example. And then you say, oh, the best case is log n. And that could be different from your worst case or your average case. So um, again, I, I feel like I haven't given this enough time to persuade anybody, but. Um, it, it's like saying, you could say, um, we could pick this algorithm to serve 100 customers, or we could pick this other algorithm and serve 1,000, but occasionally one of them will be shot in the head. Yes. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. We'll just pick the, we'll pick the one where we serve 999 and kill one. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to skip this. Th I said I was going to talk more about sorts, but I'm not going to. But um, it was a segue to this next issue, which is what other do we? So I talked. I mentioned that we care about algorithms compete on resources, and the, the one we talk about the most is time, but it's not the only one. So we also care about how much memory they use up. And so we can again use Big O to talk about how the memory they consume grows with the size of the question. And so that was why I had this quick this sorting thing here. Um, um, there's a lot to recommend merge sort, and in fact, um, Python's built-in sort, which um, the person who wrote it named after himself, and it's sort of a kind of a combination of a bunch of different things, but it's sort of kind of merge sort-ish, kind of sort of. Um, it has this kind of drawback that it uses up extra space, and if, if, if he'd use quick sort, it wouldn't use up any extra space. If he was, well, it would use less extra space. It would use big O of log n extra space for the stack instead of big O of n extra space on the heap, which is. Um, but he's, you know, he actually has a justification when he, in the commit where he's like, um, you know, it's just extra pointers and the size of pointers compared to the size of objects. I don't care. I'm willing to make this trade off and I get all the other great benefits out of it and blah, blah, blah. But it is a thing, right? He's like, he's accepted that on a really big list that just barely fits into memory. He needs some extra space, and maybe that would go over. And if he used a quick sort, I mean, he'd, get, he'd have given up all the other many real advantages that it has. But he might still have been able to do the sort. So uh, memory is, a, is another resource that you might care about the consumption of. Um, it's often the case that you can improve speed by using up more memory or vice versa. That's time, time space trade-offs. Very common, very common thing. Um, you might not care about the big O of all the operations, just the big O of the slow operations, like the ones that access disk. Um, so you could just measure those. Another weird one is entropy. So cryptographic functions need entropy to be secure, right? And uh, entropy turns out to be a resource that can be consumed. And so if you, for example, look at the Linux kernel mail list posts about like this random number generator for this other one, and blah, blah, blah. There's all this stuff about like, what should we do when somebody uses up all the entropy in our entropy pool faster than we can generate new entropy? This is not a problem you run across very friggin' often, but it is a thing. Sometimes you care how much randomness your algorithm requires to run. In the case of crypto, that's to run while preserving security. Um, and I think I'm just going to skip this last example. Um, I guess the short version is, um, no, so there's something I want to say about this example, which is this. Um, you can probably mostly ignore that. Um, but um, you get to pick what variables go into your big O, right? Like what, what variables are in your G. So the, the obvious candidate for your, the variable in your G is the size of your input. Most problems, that's the relevant thing. Um, so you know, you're know you sorting, you care how many things you've got to sort. It doesn't matter what the things are, you're just going to do the same comparison on them no matter what they are, right? Sorting 1, 2, 3, 4 versus sorting 100, 200, 300, 400, it's like it's the same problem. But sometimes something else about your input is going to affect the running time. And so you should put that in your, in your big O analysis. And so, uh, like some computational geometry problems or some graph theory problems, the running time is affected by the answer. So some of the answers are big answers and some of the answers are small answers. You don't know which it is when you start running the problem. And it's going to affect how long it takes to get the answer out. So that's a real thing. So your big O, say, you know, like the big O analyses say something like, you know, O edges to the power of this and vertices to the power of this plus size of answer or something like that. Because the answer could be so big that it dominates the other things and you have to report that honestly. Um, and um, I thought I had, and so I mentioned, you had a thing about reducing one thing to the other, 
And uh, this is where that comes in. So, um, so like the original version of Dijkstra's algorithm, the one he, that like he put his name on and got famous for. Um, so the, the asymptotic running time, so it runs on a graph. Graphs have edges, edges and vertices, right? And so in a simple graph, which is no double edges and no loops, you can't have more than v squared edges because I mean you can't even have that many actually, but it's big O of v squared edges. And so if your if your asymptotic analysis has edges in it, you can just swap out the edges for v squared, and that's technically an upper bound. But some graphs don't have that many edges. So you might choose not to swap out. And that way you're saying, oh yeah, like the, if all you know is vertices, then you know that you can swap out edges for vertices squared. But if you happen to know that your graph is like pretty sparse, like your graph is just, you know, vertex, edge, vertex, edge, vertex, edge, and it's got, you know, just linear kind of number of edges, then you know this algorithm's gonna run faster on that graph than it would on the same graph if I added a bunch of extra edges in. And so, that's this example where you could kind of do this reduction from one variable in your big O to the other, but you, you give your reader more information if you don't, and it's more information that's it's considered relevant, unless you get bored and you don't want to. So, um, so you can pick whatever variables you feel are the ones that express, I mean, you have to be correct about it, of course, this is like a mathematical correctness thing, but, but whatever it is that, that really captures the running time your algorithm is a valid candidate. Size is just kind of the thing that is like kind of traditional because most of the problems that people were considering for like 50 years, most of the time, size, total size of the input was the only thing that really mattered. Um, and there's this kind of example about factoring and people, think fact, people often think factoring is linear and it comes up when you're talking about why is the RSA crypto secure? And it's like, oh, if you can factor large numbers efficiently, then you can break RSA and like, you know, break uh, like e-commerce websites and all sorts of other horrible things. Um, and you're like, oh, how could, like, how fast can I factor anyway? Well, I'll just try all the possible factors. That sounds linear, right? I'll just try each one once. And it's linear in the wrong thing. So linear is sort of true on one level, but it's not linear in the thing that people are comparing against, which is the size of the number. Um, and so it's exponential in the size of the number, as opposed to linear in the number itself. And so I know I've kind of whipped through that too fast for anybody to understand, but um, I want to kind of wind up, and so that, yeah, that's the end of that. And so, that's the end of my talk. Thanks. And the reason my email address is there is because I'm happy to, you know, if you have questions that you don't want to ask now, you can spam me if you want. We can ask a few questions now, we have a few minutes left. Uh, we also have some announcements, so uh, why don't we start, Vicki, did you have an announcement? I just want to remind everybody that um, registration for PyCon in Montreal is now open. So if you're thinking about going, uh, sign up before. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to. When is that? It's in April. I think it starts April 10th. Uh, I think. So the snow might even be off the ground by then. <laughs> you never know. Maybe, maybe not. And I think the tutorials are like the 8th and 9th. And Wait, a question what, was, what is it? PyCon. Uh, the uh, Python's annual worldwide conference. And the most fun you can ever have. I have to tell you. <laughs> it is really fun. I've gone four times, so I really recommend trying to go. Do we have people who are actually looking for jobs? Do you have a job you want to stand up and say, hey, look, I'm looking for a job. Would someone please hire me? Anyone? Now's a chance to jump up and say, hey, I'm looking stand excellent. <laughs> Uh, I'm a recent grad from the University of Delaware. Uh, I graduated with a master's in computer science, and uh, right now I'm, I'm an intern with uh, Joyces. I'm interested in machine learning uh, and data mining. And uh, uh, very cool. People will come around looking if they have jobs offer. I'm sure they'll come by and talk to you in just a few moments. And it doesn't have to be a developer. I don't think. Do you want to see? I have a project management experience, recently moved from uh, Europe to the Bay Area, and I'm looking to position myself here in the industry. Thank you. Anybody offering jobs, please stand, tell us. So, um, patent search. If anybody's ever done patent search, um, it really sucks. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's we're attempting to build a better search engine. So I'm looking for people who have experience in Solar, Python, maybe national language processing, maybe even Java enterprise. So sort of broad person who's interested in the space, uh, please come talk to them. Should I give a contact? Yeah, please, and, and also we'll, we'll have time to just socialize afterwards, so please just, that's why we're standing up, everyone can see your face and come over and say, let me come, let me, let me give you my card, I want a job. Someone else offering jobs, please stand up. Please. Hi, uh, I'm Harsh, I work for the startup in San Francisco called uh, Marketing Media. Uh, we are the display art network for affluent audiences, and we run on a Python stack. Uh, we are looking for Python developers who have a uh, hunger to learn. So, and you would take interns or people who just set up college as well. We could. Yeah, excellent. I see lots of batches going on. Who else is offering a job? Anyone else? I'll plug up. It's not my problem, but um, I'm Chris Hodder. I'm working for a startup company delivering what we call the Start Logic, and we need. We're not doing sufficient testing, of course. I think people say they are doing some yeah. We're after a uh, QA automation engineer to build up our automation infrastructure. Excellent. Anyone else offering? Stand up so people can come uh, look for you afterwards. Anyone else looking? Same thing. Um, yes. So um, I recently graduated with a bachelor's in computer engineering, and I'm looking for a junior developer position in Java or Android. Or Python. <laughs> Excellent. Um, fair enough. Any other any other announcements tonight? I'm sure there are plenty of other announcements. Um, uh, PyCon is actually excellent. I love doing PyCon. I'm actually, uh, I was like, Vicky, hurry up, let me, let me sign up and get my tickets for you, announce it to everyone. So I have to uh, do that myself. I've gone the last few years as well. I really, really like it. It's not as close as Santa Clara this year, but I still think it's going to be well worth it. Any other announcements? Now's the time so before we start socializing. How much is PyCon growing? Um, tickets to 300? About 300. This year, the problem, yeah, go ahead. Um, it is, it's 300 is more for a corporate thing, but there is financial aid available if you uh, ask for it early, and there's even special financial aid set aside for women. And I know they've flown people in from India and all sorts of things. You can just ask for like the $300 to go to conference free, or you can ask for travel and hotel and everything. You know, it's, it's so don't let the um, lack of funds be a barrier to, uh, going. Yeah, and this year I think they'll actually be looking for people I don't know, but when it was in Santa Clara, it was very close and lots of people were, were there. This year it's going to be in Montreal, so I'm hoping that we get the same crowd, but you know, keep keep trying. And you will need a passport. Yeah, please, <laughs> you will need a passport that you so will need to do that So if you plan on going, go get your, you know, do your passport application now if you don't have one. All right, Jeremy has given an excellent talk and has room for questions, I believe. We are right at nine. We are not being rushed out of here, and there's a lot of faces and new faces to come talk to. So, random access. Get well, up. Maybe see. people would rather talk to each other. So. <laughs> oh, they can talk to you also after here. So, have questions, come talk to Jeremy. If you want to, uh, Stephen, yeah? Yeah, uh, question I think I asked last, last month, didn't get any uh, takers. Um, anybody who has worked with uh, HDFS, um, who knows about a pickling, pickling a string or a string buffer? HDFS people will come talk to you right afterwards. Yeah, so Pandas has some performance issues with fixing string bugs. All right, excellent. So lots of people, lots of faces. Don't feel rushed out. Um, plenty of time to talk. If you're looking for a job or if you're, you're offering a job, let's uh, look at faces. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you again for joining us.